Hello everybody and welcome to another video and today it is the 7th of September and I want to start out by announcing that we're going to be launching um, a discord server and I have a link in the description if anyone's interested so if you want to join it's down there so anyway we have a lot of news to cover and it's mainly from the Balaclia region not even the Harrison region and just due to like the nature of the maps, I'm just going to be using this mode, like the editing mode, because I could use the ruler to like measure stuff. I know it looks a bit weird with like the margins, the way margins of the polygons, but it will suffice for now. So let's get into this. In the Harrison region, we really don't have much of an update. I just changed the map to show that. All of Visokopilia is under Ukrainian control. I think for sure now that is the case. And in relation to Visokopilia, the Ukrainians, they released images of badges that they captured of Russian VDV assault troopers from the 11th Air Assault Brigade. So that just confirms that the VDV is one of the main components in the battle of Herson. so that's just a side note but in regards to like actual changes to the front line I really don't have much to update from here it was mainly just positional fighting and nothing happens uh, happened at all in the past few days in the Posadkovskaya axis um, even in the axis over here the bridgehead around Andrivka there was really nothing that occurred just fighting around the Suki Stavak area so we're going to have to wait and see if anything changes over here or if it just turns into a stalemate. In which case, Russia could really take advantage of the fact that Ukraine is isolated by this river. And make sure that the entire bridgehead is quelled. Now, in the area on Bilahirka, there were some clashes, but that is a given by now. In terms of casualties, I'm going to read out the Russian allegations and the Ukrainian allegations so everybody gets a pretty good idea of what both sides are saying. So, according to the Ukrainian Operational Command South, the Russian losses for today were 83 troops and they said that they were liquidated, so I'm going to assume that's like deaths. Um, 5 tanks, 12 howitzers, 3 guns. 3 armored vehicles, 1 Orlon 10 drone, 1 Su-25, and 3 warehouses in Hula Pristan, which I'm pretty sure, if my memory serves me right, is over here, and in Tomina Balka, which is over here, and funnily enough, at first there were like some Ukrainian sources saying that they had captured Tomina Balka. But if they're striking it, then yeah, there's no way that happened. And also, of course, on Sniharivka, very key town right next to the front line. So that's the Russian casualties in the Harrison region. Still high, not that high though, especially in comparison to the Russian claims about Ukrainian casualties on this front. So I'm going to talk now in total. In total, the Armed Forces of Ukraine reported that 20 tanks, 36 um, armored command vehicles, 15 artillery systems, 4 self-propelled guns, 1 plane, 1 helicopter, 15 vehicles slash fuel tanks, and 460 men were quote-unquote liquidated in total today. So, I would just assume that the majority of the people that were quote-unquote liquidated occurred in the Black Balaclia region and not necessarily in the Harrison region. Now, in terms of Russia's allegations of Ukrainian losses, the Russian Ministry of Defense reported that, first of all, the armed forces of Ukraine stopped their offensives in the area around Kherson that they were really not able to gain any more steam and that in terms of offensive operations they have really lowered it a notch and what they're saying is that 
one MiG-29, one Su-25 were shot down in action by the Russians, and four tanks, 11 armored fighting vehicles, and more than 150 Ukrainian troops were killed in the fighting. And Russia uses the language destroyed when they talk about deaths, so just be aware of that. Now, something interesting that I wanted to share is that the Washington Post actually had a really cool article. Um, it talked about like on the ground reports from Ukrainian soldiers that were fighting in the Kherson region and were wounded. And they just gave their side of the story as to what's going on over here. And some of the stuff that they described is um, very gruesome. So I'm going to link that in the description because they do talk about sort of the issues facing the Ukrainian army as they conducted this assault. And specifically this one guy, this platoon commander, he talked about how um, he was inj injured in action. And he basically said that from his experience, his men, for every five that they lost, the Russians lost one. So it's a 5 to 1 KD ratio for the Russians and of course that's just from one platoon but again this is just a one part of a much broader problem in terms of Ukraine's casualties which I did talk about earlier in terms of the reports now this platoon commander he also complained about the Orlan drones one of which was shot down according to Ukraine um, but but that Russia obviously has many more. So he said that the Orlan drones they f fly about like one kilometer over the ground, so it is sort of difficult to hear the buzz that comes from drones usually. So they're not able to spot them and shoot them down. So that's how the Russians are able to get pretty good information about the positions of the Ukrainians as they're conducting these assaults. And that's just a major problem in general. Another thing that they were complaining about is the fact that, like, a lot of their drones, probably like Bayraktars and loitering munitions, a lot of those drones were actually getting hacked by the Russian forces, and they were just steered towards Russian territory, and then they could um, use it themselves, perhaps. Now, in terms of artillery... The, this other guy, he claimed that for every three shells fired by the AFU, Russia fired 20 shells. So that's a very high amount of imbalance in terms of shelling. And this was just from like one infantry soldier. So of course it could be different along the entire line. But that's just what he said in the article. And as a result of all of this, Obviously, the Ukrainian forces have to ration on their munitions, and they have to use each one very wisely. If they don't, then they're going to run out, run out of it pretty quickly. So, the problem is, all of the coordinates that are being used by like the Ukrainian electronic systems are out of date, because they're from the Soviet system, which is from 1989, and now, of course things have changed in the 30 years or so since then and it's just a really outdated system so you wouldn't be able to like track down Russian positions correctly based on those coordinates and that also created a whole host of problems for the Ukrainians when they were launching the counteroffensive. Another thing is the Russians in preparation for the counteroffensive in this area they actually built the cement fortifications in several key points along the front lines and they had their tanks hide behind this and they conduct these sort of hit and run attacks as the Ukrainian infantry assaulted their positions and the tanks would come out decimate the infantry and then go back to hiding behind the cement fortifications and behind those cement fortifications there was mortar and artillery crews that were firing upon them and that sort of hindered any attempts at destroying these fortifications. So that was a big problem that a lot of the troops on the ground complained about. One last thing about this article is that the Russian counter-battery radar systems were 
very good counter battery systems which were able to locate the firing points of the Ukrainians and then obviously tell the artillery about it and then they would just fire a large barrage and they have enough shells to like expend as much as they need in order to dis destroy these positions even if it, they're not the most accurate so that's just what comes from the wounded AFU soldiers so I found that interesting and if you do you can read the full article in the descriptions now one last thing I want to mention from the Harsan region is that there were reports that the 147th artillery regiment from the city Simferopol which is here in uh, Crimea I think that's where it's stationed that they were transferred to the fighting in the Harrison region due to the obviously the counteroffensive. So they're a part of the First Guards tank army. And the reason this is so interesting is because this army was never present in the south. It fought in the beginning of the war in the area around Chernihiv and also around Kharkiv, um, Nijin. Romney, Priliki, this area, basically the northeast. And then afterwards, it was moved to the Izium area where it's stationed now. I even have a map of it over here on the deployment map. Look, you could see over here the, um, the first guards tank army is stationed very close to Izium, and that's really where they've been fighting. There's really been no instances of any units from this army fighting in the Harrison region, but it seems as if some of them have been diverted. And the very interesting thing about this is that this is the, one of the main armies that is centered around the Balaklia region as well, because, you know, Izium and Balaklia, they're not too far from each other. So perhaps this diversion in troops did allow the AFU to get a better chance at advancing in the Balaklia region and making actually some breakthroughs. Another interesting headline though is from CNN where they reported that US and Ukrainian officials told them that they were really pl planning to retake most of the Kherson region by the end of 2022. So I am interested to see if that also includes somehow crossing the river and taking even like these major cities over here like Novakakovka. I'm really wondering if that's in their plans. But anyway, let's move on to the Velika Novosilka area where there are clashes going on in Vermivka and the DPR forces are advancing around here. You could see the entire settlement falling under their control soon. It was pretty fortified because it is on the approaches of this other town, which is even larger, Velika Novosilka. And something that I'm thinking about is that you see this area over here. It's really surrounded from three sides by the Yali River and the Shoitanka River. Although it is pretty shallow, so they can pretty much cross over this area over here. They have like um like a half a mile distance that they could cross through. The thing is though, if they are like centered in this area, if Russia were to like advance, it might be cut off just due to the river being on all sides and that could lead to the Ukrainians in this area prematurely withdrawing just in order to get a better position and then the map would look more like this So do look out for what happens in this area There is a warehouse over here that has been shelled pretty recently by the Russian forces so it's clearly a target of theirs and There are several warehouses in here that I'm going to highlight that are probably being used to store Ukrainian equipment and other such things so, Russia is probably going to target these areas in the coming days if they want to, like, make some sort of 
gains in the Zaporizhia, well, actually, that's Donetsk, but the Donetsk area. Now, in the Vukhlidar area, there's really not anything to report on. I haven't talked about it in a while. The reason is, this area is very heavily mined. You have a lot of mines placed in the open fields, which really are preventing the Russians from advancing with their vehicles. So, again, they've really just decided to dig in and focus more on artillery barrages and airstrikes in this area to quickly, um, well not quickly, but over a long period of time just decimate the Ukrainian forces as much as possible. And then once they're battered to a certain extent, they can then move in on it. But for now, there's not going to be anything. Many of the troops from Vukhladar have actually retreated from the first line of defense, which is around here. So they've already moved past Vukhladar towards like Vodiane over here, or like some other towns around here, just in order to escape from Russia's constant artillery shelling, which has proven fatal for many of them. The Russians are using their helicopters at pretty low altitude to go after some of the camouflage the Ukrainian equipment which is really around this area so that's really what the Ru Russian and DPR forces are up to in this area in the pesky area the Ukrainians are attempting some counterattacks just to stall the Russian advance towards Pervomaiske and Vodiane so that's why we haven't seen any Russian advances around here. The Ukrainian general staff reported an attack on Opitny, but of course they said that it failed. That's what they say for really any town that is near the front lines. And when they omit a town, that's when you know that that town, there's been some success for the Russians. And that's sort of what happened with Kodema today. In Kodema, the Ukrainian general staff decided to omit the entire town and just forget about it. So that implies that it is fully under Russian control, which I talked about yesterday. And they did report about assaults in the direction of Mikolaevka Druha over here, which again is on lower elevation. It is more difficult to defend, and it is a pretty small town. You just have this like. I don't know if that's a sandy region, but it's just an open area with a little pond. And of course you have a few bushes and some houses and berms and stuff like that, but nothing too significant. Also, there were reports on that, that the town Mikolaevka was being attacked and again, no like report about the two towns being taken, but it does indicate that the front line is shifting towards these two towns. So like, it could look more like this now, perhaps. So I'll ha I will have to update it if that turns out to be true. Again, the AFU reported about the fighting reaching Vesela Dolina and Zaitseve, but they say that they pushed it back. Same thing um, with Bakhmut. They said that they pushed back attacks on Bakhmut and on Sodar. Nothing really occurring over here. The AFU also talked about failed assaults on Riharivka. And that's really it in terms of fighting in this area. So now I'm going to get to the most important part of the front line at the moment, which is no longer Kherson. It's actually the Balaklia region where Ukraine actually had pretty good success in their first two days of this counterattack over here and I'm going to go pretty in depth about the situation in here right now. So over the past day the Ukrainians have really been focusing on advancing along this road over here which is the T2110 road so I'm going to highlight it now. It's this entire road over here and it then connects to the MO3 road which is over here which is a much more important highway which they really wanted to reach 
in order to disrupt Russian supply lines because this is a very important highway in terms of connecting Hrakove and Volo Volokivyar, Vesele, and then most importantly, Izium. So it does connect Izium to some of the other towns around the front line. And of course, Izium could still be connected with some other roads around here. Like you have some less professionally paved roads that could be used to transport equipment and supplies to and from Izium around this area. And then also you have this one highway which connects to Izium and then crosses over the Oskil River and reaches Kupiansk, which is a very important city and might be Ukraine's goal in this entire counterattack. And the thing is, it crosses over this bridge. If Ukraine reaches like the range where they can start shelling this with the HIMARS, which I think they can, it's not like that far away. It's only like 18 miles, not too bad. They can reach this bridge and actually disrupt Russia supplies even more by doing that. So I am interested to see if they end up choosing to do that because they have deployed HIMARS to this region and they are using HIMARS on Izium, Kupiansk. They are firing pretty heavily on these two cities now and they are pretty deep into the front lines actually, but especially Kupiansk, that's really of the main focus. And at the moment, the Ukrainians are like 25 miles from Kupiansk. That's just a rough estimate, but to be fair, in the beginning of this entire offensive, they were like, I would say, 37, 36 miles away from the Kupiansk city. So that means that the Ukrainians, they like advanced at least on that one front that I um, went over by like 12 miles something like that 11 12 miles which is pretty good in two days and that might be a part of the fact that first of all russia really doesn't have many men in this area so they are more inclined to just abandon their positions once they see that a superior force is advancing towards them and they can like cons consolidate their defensive positions perhaps in some other area maybe using a key city as a defensive point to coordinate the defense or some river um that that's possible and if they were to do that then they would have to withdraw from like many other towns at the moment because ukraine has created this spearhead which then creates opportunities for flanking the russian positions so i'm going to highlight the areas that could be flanked at the moment so there was a report by russian sources of an attack towards this town over here chakolovsk and the problem is for russia if this town were to fall then the rest of these highlighted areas would be in dire straits they would pretty easily fall because first of all there are not many men here and it would basically just be let's say a five mile gap in between the two Ukrainian groupings so they would be able to pretty easily encircle whatever Russian forces are in here although I would say that they probably don't have a lot of forces in this area and if Ukraine makes like continued gains tomorrow they might just decide to withdraw from this entire area in general just to consolidate the, their defensive line also in the area of Balaklia, the Ukrainians have failed to actually enter the town. The line of fighting is around the armory number 65 over here, which is filled with important equipment that I'm sure Russia will have to like quickly transfer out in order to prevent it from falling into Ukrainian hands. And then also some of the bridges over here were blown up. There's like two that were blown up in this area. And that was just to prevent the Ukrainian breakthrough into the city. So no, it's still under Russian control. No Ukrainians in the city. But it is dangerously close to falling. It's in about an 180 degree encirclement according to 
the Russians are actually on the ground. That's what they're saying. And they're saying that Ukraine has like total artillery domination in the area around Balaklia and that they're just firing constantly onto their positions. There's a very small civilian population left in here. It's mainly just the small amount of Russian forces that are still holding out. And specifically, some of them are actually coming from the Spetsnaz Special Rapid Response Unit. And there are two detachments specifically that were mentioned by the Russian reports. One is called Omega and one is called Toplar. So these are the two detachments that are really holding the ground around this area and preventing the Ru Ukrainians from taking their positions in Verbivka and pushing towards the armory. But they were not able to prevent Ukraine from attacking in this area, which is south of the bank of um, the Severodonetsk River. So you had the 93rd Mechanized Brigade and the 1st Special Forces um, Brigade. They attacked the three towns over here, which were previously taken by Russia over the past month. By Iraq, Novohusarivka, and Shucharivka. I think they took them without any contest because the Russians, they had previously blown up the bridge over here, which sort of implied that they had already left the settlements. So now it's just confirmed that the Ukrainians entered them. I don't think they'll be crossing the river. It would be pretty difficult to do so unless they construct some pontoons and then they could like maneuver outside these forested areas and perhaps they can then harass the Russian garrison within Balaklia itself. But Russia's air force would probably deal with it. Another thing they're probably going to do is at least to try to ta attack Savinsi because it is a key city in the area around the river. And the thing is, if this town were to fall and the Ukrainians created another bridgehead, they would be able to pretty easily maneuver throughout this entire area until they reached the MO3 road from another area. And then from there, this entire highlighted area would be exposed to encirclement. So not only do you have the pocket that I previously talked about, which could be encircled, but you have another pocket that could be potentially formed. But this would only be able to happen if the Ukrainians cross the river, which is pretty difficult. We saw how they like had a lot of difficulty with crossing the Inhulets, although they eventually succeeded. But the Donetsk River, it is very wide in comparison to some of the other rivers. And Russia also had issues with crossing it. So it would also be difficult for Ukraine. So another thing that is worth mentioning from this area is that the Ukrainians, although they did capture some of these towns like Yakovenkov, Vovchiar, Kalinivka, and Tarunushine. They really did bypass this town in specific, uh, Volokivyar, and there are two Volokivyars for some reason within like eight miles of each other. So there was a video filmed of the Ukrainians reaching the crossroads between the T2110 road and the MO3 road. So that's like right over here. So clearly they are in the town, and there are no Russian troops in the town either, but Ukraine doesn't really have a permanent presence in here, they just sort of like entered and just continued advancing. So the front line is very fluid, but it is centered around advancing even more towards Kupiansk, and specifically now they're fighting around Semenivka, and I'm not sure whether it's under Russian or Ukrainian control, that is a really like a really gray area right now. So I just don't want to make any definitive conclusions, but the map does look roughly like this, where this entire area is contested, but Russia still can hold, uh, holds Bohora Darivka. And if Ukraine is able to break through over here, and then they can actually reach Shevchenkov, which first of all is a key rail hub in this area and it's also a pretty large settlement on the road to Kupiansk 
from this town. It's only 19 miles to Kupiansk, which is actually like a lot in terms of the Ukraine war because you don't really see either side making 19 miles gained over the course of a few days, but it is possible given the lack of Russian forces in this area, but something that I did read is that over the past few weeks, Russia has been amassing reserves in the area around Kupiansk, not Balaklia, but specifically Kupiansk, so perhaps they were willing to give up some ground in the area west of the Oskil River, and then sort of fortify Kupiansk in order to beat back the Ukrainians and then because they're so overextended because they really are overextended at the moment they've made these pretty crazy advances in a day or two and they haven't been able to consolidate and if they do consolidate that might give Russia some time to prepare their own counterattacks. so I could understand why they're just continuing at a rapid pace but it is a double-edged sword so let's say they beat back the Ukrainians here which um, it, it is certainly possible, especially if they have a larger force than the Ukrainians. The Russian sources reported that roughly Ukraine was utilizing 9,000 troops in this assault. So if they're able to organize, the, say, the Third Corps to move here, then they could push them back from Kupiansk. And then it would be, um, first of all, very ha heavy casualties for the Ukrainians. And many of them would not be able to reach the original positions in time and... Many of them would just be destroyed in that. So I think that's what Russia might be looking for as a worst case scenario. If they're not able to hold Shevchenkov and some of these other towns around here that I have marked in red. So that's really what to look out for in the Balaklia front. Um, really the nexus of the Ukrainian assault is centered around Chukhuiv. So remember that and this one other town, uh, Andrivka over here. So these are the two towns that are mainly being used, and Russia is cognizant of this. They struck two command posts, one in Andrivka and then one in Chukhuiv. And of course you have the daily strikes on Kharkiv. So that's it for now. Thank you all for watching. Join the Discord, and I will see you later.